Welcome to this session of organizational behavior. Today we will be talking about perception and individual decision making. In our daily life, uh, both at a personal space and our in our workplace, we always perceive um, about different things. We uh, face different situations and we pass our feelings about it. We grew our feelings about it and eventually we decide on do something uh, based on those stimuli. This chapter talks about such perception. Uh, it defines it. It also talks about the processes we perceive uh, different things um, as human beings. And eventually we will be looking into how these perceptions can have effects on our uh, decision making process, both at the personal level and primarily at the organizational level. And we will be also looking into, uh, in the readings and the explanations of this chapter, the different uh, uh, processes and different challenges and the uh, different uh, biases and errors uh, in, in such decision-making uh, uh, cycles. And then we will be also looking into the different uh, ethical dimensions that's related with perceptions and decision making criteria. And then finally, as we all always do, we, we will be summing it up by saying or highlighting uh, why uh, it's important for the managers or the business leaders, leaders to look into perception and decision making process at an individual level for the workforce. Let's first look into the definition of perception. According to the book, perception is a process by which individuals organize and interpret their sensory impressions in order to give meaning to their environment. Now, it's important to study it in OB because uh, what we see that people's ideas, people's feelings, people's behavior are always based on their own perception and not always is rational and it's not always based on the reality uh, or the things at hand itself. So that's why it's critical for us to understand this. Exhibit 6.1 talks about the way we perceive stuff. Uh, it uh, shows the different factors that influence perception. Uh, on the top, we see the factors that we carry with ourselves, we bring on the table when we perceive something. Uh, it talks about attitudes, motives, interests, experience and expectations that we have. And those can be personal and also there can be some carryover effects uh, from the societal perspectives. And then the factors which are in the situation uh, itself, uh, um, the time, the work setting, the social setting, and then the, the things that are in place, that the things about which we are going to perceive about something. Uh, so there can be uh, factors uh, related to novelty, motion, different kind of sound, size, or background. And eventually, all together, it all has some sort of impacts on the way we are going to build or develop our perception. Attribution theory, which we are seeing in this slide, helps us to better understand the way the people judge uh, differently uh, in our daily life. It suggests that when we observe an individual's behavior, we attempt to determine whether it, it, it was internally or externally caused. And such determination, uh, according to this theory, depends on three factors, uh, distinctiveness, consensus and consistency. In the previous slide, we talked about the internal and external causalities. Uh, so this attribution theory also explains and clarifies the difference between two, uh, these two factors. Uh, according to the uh, researchers, internally caused issues are those that are believed to be under personal control of the individual and externally caused events are the one resulting from the outside causes. This slide graphically represents attribution theory, where we see that first, as a person, we observe certain things, 
and then we try to interpret to see whether or not it's distinctive, whether or not we can uh, reach on any consensus about uh, that event, uh, about the different criteria of that event, and whether or not such a consensus can be achieved over a period of time, whether or not those are consistent. And then we attribute to of, uh, to such ev we, we attribute the events, uh, the outcome of the events or the perception of that events to uh, some external or internal causes. So there have been many examples uh, to further explain this theory uh, in the book chapter, which I think it's strongly recommended for us to read. Now, there are some fundamental attribution errors when we apply these theories. What we see that in real life, we have always the tendency to underestimate the influence of external factors, and we always overestimate the influence of the internal or personal factors. For example, we, ha we see it in the book that uh, this person who was not doing that well in the business uh, started blaming her uh, employees. Uh, uh, the efficiency of the employees and she was claiming that these people working under her are lazy but what she was overlooking is the efficiency of her competitors and the way they were uh, aggressively marketing and uh, snatching all the customers she had so here what we are seeing that we, we have uh, we are underestimating that person is underestimating the external influences and at the same time, we also see there, are, there is a factor called self-serving bias where we are always uh, very happy to talk about our achievements, our successes. We always attribute uh, our own successes to the internal factors. And at the same time, we, we completely ignore or we try to always uh, put, put it in the back seat when we are listening to any kind of criticism about our performance. Uh, in the in the real life Now in the real life there are many errors done by us when we are making judgment about others and in the next few slides We talk about uh, several of them. The first one here is uh, the selective perception so any characteristic that makes a person object or any event stand out uh, always uh, has the probability of uh, being a higher probability of getting a notice to be perceived so we can't observe anything going on around us and we just engage ourselves in such selective perception so that uh, definitely um, give giving the gives in the way for you know, an erroneous judgment about something or some factor the other shortcut that sometimes we use while judging others is the halo effect, uh, which occurs when we drew um, a general impression on the basis of a single characteristics. Uh, for, for example, uh, imagine that uh, uh, the subjects were given, uh, uh, it, then this is a classic study that is related to the book. So in a study, the subjects were given a list of traits like uh, uh, of a person, of intelligent, skillful, practical, industrious, and warm. And then they were asked to evaluate the person to whom those traits applied. Uh, so when the word warm was substituted with cold, the subjects uh, changed their evaluation of that person. Uh, who they were looking into for the developing uh, their perception. So such experiment showed that the subjects were allowing a single trait to influence their overall impression uh, of the person being judged. So the research according to the book suggests that it is likely to be most extreme when the traits to be perceived are ambiguous in behavioral terms uh, and when the traits have moral overtones and when the perceiver uh, is judging traits with which he or she has had very limited experience. So halo effect is something very critical and we should always watch out for that. Then uh, the other thing becomes the contrast effects. So 
what happens here, for example, in the interview, uh, we do not evaluate a person in isolation. Our reaction in many, many times uh, to one person is influenced by other persons we have recently en encountered. And then what happens, uh, distortions can be there uh, for any given candidate's uh, uh, evaluation. And uh, that can be going in a wrong way that can go positive or negative for her. This is uh, one of the most uh, happening uh, <laughs> problem that we always face in our daily life, which is stereotyping. So the formal explanation of uh, definition of stereotyping is judging someone on the basis of uh, uh, their on the basis of the our perception of the group to which he or she belongs to. So this is a means of simplifying the complex world, but at the same time, this is also something that we drag in our lack of experience, lack of exposure to something else. And then uh, it, in any way, that's, that is not fair for the people that we are judging, uh, judging on based on our stereotyping. So we certainly need to make sure that uh, uh, we are not unfairly applying stereotyping in our evaluations and decisions. Uh, never ever there is an instance where stereotyping, uh, at, at least in my opinion, uh, uh, caused any better thing. And we talked about stereotyping, we talked about our problems when we are, uh, the challenges we face when we are interviewing so many people at, at a group, uh, then how we can um, develop the perceptions. So. Imagine when we are hiring somebody, when we are talking about hiring better human resources for, the, for our company. Now, in the previous lectures, we talked about the way it's very, very important uh, to uh, hire uh, people with certain characteristics uh, for certain jobs, right? Uh, now, while we want to do this, it's easier uh, said than done. Because then, while we are interviewing uh, many people, uh, there have been research that indicates that interviewers make perceptual judgments uh, that are often inaccurate. And we, we do those judgments in the first uh, three, four minutes uh, or five minutes of the interview. And hardly those impressions are changed as the interview progresses. So that's one of the uh, human nature, vulnerability we have, we are prone to. Now, we talked about the interview processes. We talked about the problems we have uh, about perceiving somebody or passing judgment on somebody uh, when we are looking for developing our own human resource pool. Now, after that, when we are in the work setting, there are also some problems about making judgments. Uh, first of all, uh, performance expectations is one, according to this book where we see that the managers, the leaders can uh, set up uh, some sort of a work benchmark, a performance benchmark uh, in, in order to validate their perceptions about reality. Um, according to them, that's uh, an achievable thing. And then what happens and people uh, try to achieve that kind of uh, goal uh, that's set up by the leader without looking into whether or not that's, that's, that's something really uh, possibly achievable. So that's one. And what the other factor that the book talks about is the self-fulfilling prophecy uh, that characterizes the fact that people's expectations determine their behavior. Uh, and in many cases, we have seen that in also our previous chapters where we see that uh, the people uh, based on their different characteristics, they also expect um, uh, to hire similar kind of people, similar natured people or people who hire, uh, who are hired by them. They want them to behave uh, like the CEO or the to have the similar kind of stimuli, similar kind of uh, uh, expectations, similar kind of work ethic. So that's all related to such uh, characteristics uh, based on self-fulfilling prophecy. And then these expectations become reality and those become uh, official uh, in, a, in a formal way. Now, 
whether or not these are good or bad, depending, of course, on the company's practices. But what we have seen evidence is that such kind of practice of self-fulfilling prophecy is not usually a good thing. And then, one of the bitter experience we all have uh, in our uh, work life is performance evaluation. Now, while uh, the managers do this, in many cases, no matter how much we try, uh, many jobs uh, are evaluated in a subjective terms. And these subjective measurements, of course, are a bit problematic because of selective perception. Uh, we talk about contrast effects, we talk about halo effects. So the managers or the leaders are all susceptible to such errors when they are making judgment about others. Hence, the performance evaluations in many organizations can be not fair. Uh, so these are certainly a huge problem. Based on our uh, different ways of perceiving others, uh, making judgments about different performances uh, based on our ideas. Uh, certainly, we are making many decisions uh, and certainly in the workplace, we have to make decisions. And we make decisions uh, uh, among uh, different alternatives, two or three alternatives that we have uh, uh, at our hand. And in the more modern work setting, in a multinational, local or uh, regional level, um, not only the top managers are making decisions. Uh, the top managers have their own ideas of uh, own responsibilities than the middle and in many cases the non-managerial employees are also assigned uh, and, and be trusted with uh, some decision-making process in a work setting. Now according to the book uh, decision-making occurs as a reaction to a problem. So I kind of not entirely agree with it that it has to be a problem but certainly there will be a scenario where people need to uh, pick uh, pick or choose between multiple options and those can be a problem those can be opportunities those can be challenges uh, whatever we we look into so but what we can agree on is uh, not all the choices that we make uh, while uh, we are deciding on something will be satisfactory to uh, everybody. One person's problem is another's uh, satisfactory state uh, or affairs, uh, state of affairs. That, that's for certain, that's for sure. And then when we make such decisions, when everybody is not happy, some are happy and in many cases uh, it, it may or may not be good for the company, uh, what we are looking into, the factors, are based on what we are uh, interpreting and evaluating those uh, decisions. And uh, uh, are the data that uh, we are gathering before we making such decisions, uh, are those uh, coming from multiple sources? Uh, are those relevant to the decisions that we are uh, making on? Uh, so these are the factors that uh, certainly the managers or the people who are assigned to make decisions certainly need to look into. And on top, we also need to ask ourselves whether are we objective about the way we are looking into our professional uh, decisions or there are some other external or internal factors uh, uh, that uh, are in play here. So alternatives need to be developed and the strengths and the weaknesses of each factors or the uh, options certainly has to be evaluated. So this exhibit 6.3 talks about the steps uh, a rational decision maker uh, should uh, follow. First uh, one needs to define the problem then certainly needs to identify the decision criteria, allocate weights to different criteria, and develop the alternatives, evaluate the alternat alternatives, and eventually select the best option uh, for the decision-making process. Now, the problem is that in the real world, such rational model may or may not work because uh, we assume in a rational model that the decision maker has a complete information 
uh, and has the ability to identify all the relevant options in an unbiased manner and certainly choose uh, uh, will be able to choose the option with the highest utility but we all know there are so many factors in play uh, that can uh, hinder such rational model of uh, decision making now in the real world how we deal with such problems because as human being it's not always very easy or possible to follow the rational model for decision making so the book talks about different options one is bounded rationality um, here the authors explain that for example imagine that we are facing um, a complex problem and it's not always possible to look for all the possible solutions, alternatives for such a complex problem and also to judge the possible utility all these options individually can bring in. So hence what people do uh, is people uh, actually bound the problems at a certain level. Uh, it, uh, it considers it based on certain criteria, and uh, it simplifies the problem itself and then look for the options, the solutions and the possible utilities those uh, which are satisfactory and sufficient. So the book uh, coins the word satisfies, uh, which is a mix of satisfactory and uh, sufficient uh, both. So that is a bounded rationality. Uh, so it's relatively construct, uh, constructed in a simplified way. And uh, certainly it, uh, it has the extraction of the essential features of the original complex problem that we uh, faced at first. This slide further explains the way bounded rationality works. We talked about it for some time. Uh, the important point here is the decision maker, when they review the list of possible solutions, uh, kind of always look for a solution that is good enough. And sometimes we also see bounded rationality is very, very important and practical for a real life scenario where not only human, uh, the problem we have is with our human nature that we cannot uh, consider all the complex problem uh, com complex situations solutions and utilities even though we were able to do it in the real life when imagine that you have a production deadline you have a project uh, submission uh, you need to do it by some time and also you have a resource constraint uh, with that you have to uh, hire you can hire certain people not more than that to compute or to simulate certain problems or model some solutions. So in those cases, of course, it's very, very important for us to bound uh, the different uh, factors, unknown factors or different variables uh, in order to come up with a solution. In, 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 in science when we and engineering, when we look in this bounded rationality, uh, and uh, some sort of a solution and of course uh, there is another related stuff uh, that comes which is uncertainty analysis where when you do one does certain uh, this kind of uh, bounded rationality work he or she also talks about mentions that these are the boundaries that we are following and these are the un uncertainty uncertainties that can be caused uh, Base because of uh, you know, as the result of such a uh, selection. In addition to the bounded rationalism, there is another thing that's important. We talked about it in our previous session, which is intuition. So intuitive decision making occurs outside the our conscious thought. Uh, it relies on holistic associations, uh, links between disparate pieces of information, and also based on our um, socio-economic, uh, to some extent, uh, association, and uh, uh, in many cases, just our gut feeling. So the key is neither to abandon such gut feeling or not to just rely solely on it, but just also to 
be open to such ideas of intuition in addition to the bounded rationality uh, uh, to make some decisions when we have to. Due to our uh, limitation in uh, making uh, the rational choices uh, for a good effective decision making, there will be decision biases, there will be errors. And uh, Exhibit 6.4 um, talk about the ways one can reduce the biases and errors in decision making process and also while perceiving something. First of all, we certainly need to make sure that we focus on the goals of our work, our uh, goals uh, of our study, our research, or any kind of project that we are assigned to. And then certainly, we also should always look for information that in many cases disconfirms uh, our common belief so that uh, we can make sure that we are, we are truly looking into different options. And then, uh, we in many cases, uh, we overthink, uh, and it's important that we may not, we should not always try to create meaning out of random events. That's important, and then uh, definitely we need to increase uh, our options. Uh, and when we make the final choice, we need to make sure, uh, and we need to understand that final choice may not be better uh, best option that we have selected. And we need to be always be open to different options and different ideas. So when, as we talk about different uh, decision biases or errors, uh, one thing certainly comes uh, a lot in the book and we see it uh, in our daily life is overconfidence bias. Here we are talking about our over belief or confidence about the intellectual and interpersonal ability uh, uh, and in many cases what we have seen that the people who are kind of weakest uh, kind of weak in such uh, in such factors are most likely to overestimate their performance and ability and then um, anchoring bias is very interesting uh, and people who are involved in negotiation uh, dealing with people, uh, making big business deals. This is, uh, or in even uh, in our daily life, uh, anchoring bias is something that is very, very uh, um, applicable and very, very available. Uh, so, of, uh, formally, it talks about fixating on initial information as a starting point and uh, failing to adequately adjust for subsequent information. And now, uh, as uh, the book says, uh, anchors are widely used by people in advertising, management, politics, real estate, law. For, for example, in the book, uh, it talks about a certain job, a uh, job of a pilot uh, in an in a air carrier. So two people applied and got the job. So one salary, so the jobs, uh, I think, was uh, offering 120000 uh US dollars per per year. Now, the one person who was who has this previous job of eighty two thousand uh, US dollars per year, who was earning it, he was uh, certainly happy with this offer. But at the same time, the person who was making two hundred dollars, two hundred thousand dollars per year, uh, was not happy with this hundred twenty thousand dollars per year job offer, and same job. But two people are thinking differently based on the anchor, uh, anchored idea that they, they have, the perception they have about uh, what is a good salary or what is an acceptable salary. So that's an example to look into. And then um, we also have confirmation uh, bias and availability bias. Uh, for the confirmation bias, we talk about... we. Uh, uh, we are talking about certain people who are not open to different ideas, who are not open to different options when uh, uh, developing a perception. Uh, it's a selective perception. Uh, uh, we try to seek out the information that reaffirms our past choices, and then we discount information that contradicts the past judgments. And that's in many cases, is not fair for the people 
who uh, if they're seeking for job for the second or third time or it's not fair for the processes to look into or the projects to look into uh, which has an iterative process uh, so the people who are deciding on it suddenly needs to make sure that uh, they're open to different ideas and look for more uh, criteria rather than just the ones they are comfortable or they have dealt with before and uh, related to that is also availability bias where uh, we talk about the tendency for the people to base judgments on the information that is readily available so uh, they don't look for some other examples uh, they don't look for some other uh, important criteria for the job uh, and and then definitely uh, it's, it's it's one of the shortcuts in the administration uh, in the when we are hiring human resources that can take place and certainly that is not an optimal practice uh, for the company then uh, the book talks about uh, escalation of commitment uh, here this is something that happens when people um, say an individual is uh, wrong about something but he or she is still holding on to this and still uh, is not uh, making any changes in the de decision and then what happens that as a as a result is uh, there is a, a snowball effect in terms of everything going bad based on uh, such a, everything escalates uh, based on such a, of uh, commitment negative com uh, commitment to to a wrong decision and then uh, the other one is the randomness error this is with our classic uh, practices uh, uh, what we have where, where we have the tendency to believe that we can predict the outcome of random events uh, in some cases we do not uh, 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 do something we do not work or we do not launch a project on any uh, day uh, which has the date of 13th uh, because we think that that's not a lucky number so that's uh, something random and that's something that we should not internalize in our uh, uh, decision, rational decision making uh, process. The final two types of common decision biases or errors are the risk aversion and hindsight bias. Now, the tendency to prefer a sure thing instead of a risky outcome is the dictionary uh, definition of risk aversion and we see that the managers who are highly ambitious who, who do not want to rock the boat who they are more likely to be risk averse now when we talk about hindsight bias there had been there has been some interesting examples um, given in the book about it so it talks about the tendency to believe falsely that one has accurately predicted the outcome of an event after that uh, outcome is uh, actually known and this is this is something always happened now there there is a very interesting quote uh, that is used in the book that talks about that what is clear in the hindsight is uh, rarely clear before the fact now uh, that's true because many people are talking about for example the bankruptcy of blockbuster video uh, and others uh, when they were not being able to cope with the online uh, retailing of and uh, streaming web streaming of netflix when we are talking about uh, home video uh, businesses now People are now saying, different experts are t telling about, oh, that they should have th thought about that before, they should have strategized before, it was so obvious that online things are coming. But it, it was never the case, uh, because when uh, those others were booming, actually, uh, nobody predicted that uh, the people will be just focusing on online-based uh, uh, entertainment uh, uh, industry. So that's something always we see in practice and that's something definitely we should uh, be aware of when we are de making decisions about uh, some stuff in the workplace. As we make uh, different decisions um, based on our personality, based on the way we grew up, based on the society we belong to, definitely our decision making process will differ. 
and uh, we have seen it in the previous uh, chapter 5 lecture that uh, the personality uh, of any kind of human resources based on are based on different traits personal traits and behavior and such uh, such uh, traits and definitely can have an impact uh, in the company now there are other criteria to look into one is the culture and uh, if a company has multiple locations in multiple countries and the workforce are from multiple ethnicity multiple nationality then definitely there are there are certain challenges in uh, decision making uh, in this uh, modern time uh, at the same time uh, gender can be uh, can be an issue uh, i'm always a bit skeptical about it um, and uh, but this book talks about different studies which shows that women spend more time uh, than men in decision making and as uh, as causes behind uh, such uh, uh, taking such a long time uh, the authors are talking about are mentioning uh, the women's uh, sensitivity relative uh, is are relatively higher than men about uh, the outcomes of the decisions and also the how people will perceive themselves while they are making the decisions but i will certainly uh, urge uh, to look into these uh, findings with a pinch of salt because uh, definitely with uh, different cultures with different perspectives different uh, socioeconomic realities such uh, gender specific things can be um, can differ and may not that may not be the case anyway Organizational constraints that uh, impinge on decision making begin with performance evaluation. Managers are usually strongly influenced in their decision making process by the criteria by which they're evaluated. So any organization's reward system uh, certainly influences decision makers um, by suggesting to them what choices are preferable or preferred in terms of personal payoff. The other constraints uh, that are in hand are formal rules, uh, policies, procedures, and other formalized regulations, uh, which are created by organizations to standardize the behavior of their members. So system imposed time constraints are another influence, uh, wherein organizations uh, impose deadlines on decisions. And then uh, we also look into the historical precedents that can serve to impede, that can be a hindrance uh, in decision making. Uh, decisions have uh, always have context, right? And uh, individual decisions are more accurately characterized as points uh, in a stream of decisions. Now, decisions made in the past uh, are not always the most optimal ones and they, they, they can have uh, they can always haunt the present choices. They can, historical precedents in many ways can um, hinder, can uh, block the way towards uh, innovating some new ones, uh, uh, the new chances or new ways uh, to make uh, good decisions. So now, when we make decisions, when we deal with people, when we talk about profitability, when we talk about performance criteria, decide about who has in within the workforce who has done better uh, than others. Do we do it uh, ethically? Do we do it fairly? Uh, does it uh, make everybody happy? Is it transparent? So these are the questions that is also very critical and needs to be answered so the book talk about utilitarianism um, it talks about the way the decisions should be made solely on the basis of the outcomes and consequences and it should enforce the rules uh, fairly and impartially and ensure justice uh, uh, or an equitable distribution of benefits and costs uh, among the workforce, among the people who are the stakeholders. 
and uh, it also such a uh, ethical um, perspective uh, and the applications talks on focuses on the rights of the people and uh, such uh, things uh, uh, such uh, criteria also always uh, try to protect the whistleblowers who are trying to ensure the transparency and the ethical fairness uh, in the whole decision making process now when we talk about all these ethics like rational decision making models is this also possible to be ethical all the time when we are working or does the reality have something else in store for us what are the ethical standard we can practically follow um, and champion in our workplace so there are the and it, it becomes more complex when we are considering different cultural context because ethical standard is in many cases are not global uh, one thing that is considered unethical at certain point uh, in the, in a certain within the certain geographical location may not be uh, the same uh, in other places so how a multinational company should behave how you manage a multi ethnic multi racial um, workforce. So these are the challenges uh, the modern managers and the workforce leaders are facing. Now, when we face such problems, when we look into uh, all these decision-making issues, uh, the way we develop perceptions about others and whether or not we are doing it uh, in the right way, uh, and what we are seeing increasingly is that uh, there are newer challenges that we haven't encountered before and certainly those challenges uh, looks for entails uh, the demand uh, for um, creativity it is something of the ability to produce uh, of the ability to produce novel and useful ideas and in many cases, the managers certainly needs to uh, the managers certainly need to think outside of the box. Uh, in addition to the traditional things that they are uh, practicing, to solve certain problems, uh, to make uh, certain decisions. Uh, so, hence, creativity has a huge important role to play in uh, the decision making process. The book uh, talks about three stage model of creativity. Here we are talking about uh, first uh, facilitating something that uh, helps to nurture creative environment, creativity. We are talking about creative environment. Uh, but at the same time, we are also looking for a scenario where there are problems uh, which uh, forces people to be more creative, more non-traditional than uh, than the status quo and then when once uh, one is uh, creative uh, one is engaged in creative behavior suddenly he or she or the group needs to gather a lot of information Th it also needs to have a certain uh, environment where ideas can be generated and then definitely there should be ways to evaluate those ideas so that and People can bounce each uh, bounce off each other the ideas, and then uh, they can fail, and they can have the safety net to uh, create more stuff so that they don't feel uh, threatened uh, or they don't feel limited uh, in uh, thinking uh, for thinking outside of the box. And eventually, that can uh, result in creative outcomes, and those creative outcomes certainly can have. Uh, good can bring in good results uh, 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 for problem solving uh, certainly those can be good examples of certain decision making as long as uh, those are uh, those are passing the criteria of novelty and usefulness so not always something new solution is better if those are not useful so these are very important things to look into when we are ensuring creativity within this uh, decision making process so at the end what are the things 
that's more important. So, of course, in order to influence productivity, uh, we need to assess how our employees are perceiving their job. Uh, are they happy? Are they not engaged? Uh, and what are the ways they are in? Uh, what are the ways they are connected with their uh, assignments? Is it the optimal level? Is this the optimal way of using their capabilities? And also, we need to openly discuss the perceptions about uh, fairness, compensation, and other uh, hard to measure stuff with the workforce. A very transparent thing. And definitely, the leaders need to adjust their decision-making uh, approach uh, to the culture, to the context, to the socio-economic uh, uh, reality of the play uh, of the land where the work is going on, or the place or the space where the activities are taking place. So those can be online, those can be offline, or both. And then which is very very important very very crucial is to be beware of the biases that we carry in many cases uh, we do not even imagine uh, we do not even realize that uh, we are uh, practicing according to our mental biases so exhibit 6.4 talks about some suggestions how we can minimize the impacts of the biases that we carry and then it's uh, also important uh, to combine the rational analysis with uh, intuition. We should never discount that. And definitely we should nurture creativity. Uh, we should actively look for novel solutions for the problems. And um, we need to attempt to see the problems in new ways, uh, uh, in new perspectives. And uh, definitely uh, we should... Uh, Put, uh, we should ensure that there are no barriers uh, for, uh, for uh, nurturing and supporting such creative thinking. So, in short, that's the whole idea of this ch uh, chapter that deals with perceptions uh, and uh, decision-making. And uh, definitely, I would suggest all of us to look into the chapter more and look into the examples there are some very good examples and then we can also search for different case studies uh, um, in around ourselves and definitely online thank you